I notice your band is on the roster for the dance auditions after school today. Why even bother, McFly? You don't have a chance. You're too much like your old man. No McFly ever amounted to anything in the history of Hill Valley. Yeah, well, history is gonna change. I had a horrible nightmare. Dreamed that I went back in time. It was terrible. Well, safe and sound now, back in good old 1955. 1955? Are you telling me that you built a time machine? Out of a DeLorean? The way I see it, if you're gonna build a time machine into a car, why not do it with some style? machine that you invented. It was! <laughs> it was! Now I need your help to get back to the year 1985. You must not see anybody or talk to anybody. Anything you do could have serious repercussions on future events. Do you understand? Marty, have you interacted with anybody else today besides me? Yeah, well, I might have sort of bumped into my parents. Great Scott! Calvin! This is more serious than I thought. Apparently your mother is amorously infatuated with you instead of your father. Whoa, wait, wait a minute. Doc, are you trying to tell me that my mother has got the hots for me? So you've got to get your father and mother to interact. Last night, Darth Vader came down from Planet Vulcan and told me that if I didn't take Lorraine out, that he'd melt my brain. Yeah, well, uh, let's, let's just keep this brain-melting stuff to ourselves. Next Saturday night, we're sending you back to the future! Early July of 1985, Back to the Future hit 88 miles per hour and slammed onto the big screen. Produced on an estimated budget of $19 million, it grossed $381 million worldwide, becoming the most successful film that year, and was praised by critics and the public alike. It won an Academy Award for Best Sound Effects Editing, as well as receiving three additional Academy Award nominations, five BAFTA nominations and four Golden Globe nominations. Back to the Future Today is an important part of pop culture and film history. Back in the early 80s, writer and producer Bob Gale first conceived the idea of Back to the Future after he visited his parents, searching their basement. Bob found his father's high school yearbook and discovered his dad was president of his graduating class. Bob never knew this and thought would he have been friends with his dad or hated his guts. When he told director Robert Zemeckis his new concept, he loved the idea and came up with a few ideas of his own. Zemeckis and Gale wanted to set the story in 1955, because a 17-year-old travelling to meet his parents at the same age required the story to be set in that period. The era also marked the rise of teenagers as an important cultural element, the birth of rock and roll, TV and science fiction films. Originally they wanted the time machine to be designed as a refrigerator as its user needed to use the power of an atomic explosion at the Nevada test site to return home. Zemeckis thought it would be more convenient if the time machine was more like a car. The DeLorean was chosen because its design made the gag about the family of farmers mistaking it for a flying saucer. The car had to look cool but also the time machine parts needed to look like they had been retrofitted in a garage, having loads of the components visible to make it look like a working device. The DeLorean was famous for its poor quality build and sold poorly when it was first released to the public in 1981 and was discontinued two years later. But Back to the Future made it an iconic car overnight. It's always been a car I've always wanted to own despite my father who is obsessed with cars 
telling me so many times it's a piece of crap, but I don't care, I still want one. They took the project to Columbia Pictures, who Bob Gale and Robert Zemeckis made used cars with. In September of 1980 they struck a deal with them, but Columbia was wanting changes to the script to make it appeal more to an older audience, feeling the script was too light and sweet and wanted more of a raunchier comedy, like what was coming out during that period of the early 80s, such as Fast Times at Richmond High and Porky's. Every major film studio rejected the script for the next four years. They were told to take the idea to Disney, but Disney felt the idea of Marty's mum being in love with her son was not something that Disney wanted to be involved with. The two were attempted to team up with Steven Spielberg, who had produced Used Cars and I Wanna Hold Your Hand. Spielberg loved the project, but getting a studio to do a deal was difficult, so Zemeckis chose to direct Romancing the Stone to give his career a boost. It thankfully became a box office success. Now a high profile director, Zemeckis approached Spielberg again and asked if he was still interested, and he was. So they set up a deal with Universal Pictures and it became the first Amblin Entertainment production to not have Steven directing. The executive at Universal, Sidney Scheinberg, hated the name Back to the Future. He felt it made no sense and suggested the title Spaceman from Pluto, which Zemeckis was highly against and begged Spielberg to change Scheinberg's mind. Thankfully, with Spielberg's clout and respect in the industry, the title remained the same and was never changed. When the movie was previewed to audiences, it scored the highest ratings in Universal's history, and Scheinberg was so impressed, he pushed to have the movie released a month early to take advantage of the 4th of July holiday season. Michael J. Fox had always been the first choice for Marty, but he was unavailable due to scheduling conflicts with his work on Family Ties. The show's producer, Gary David Goldberg, simply couldn't afford to let Fox go. Zemeckis and Gale then decided to cast Eric Stoltz as Marty, based on his performance in Mask. After five weeks of filming, Robert Zemeckis and Bob Gale felt that Stoltz wasn't right for the part, and Stoltz agreed. Eric just didn't have the comedy timing they wanted and desperately needed from Michael J. Fox. The producers begged Gary Goldberg to find a way for Michael to be in Back to the Future. They managed to work out a deal, but family ties must always come first. Every day after shooting the show, he drove straight to the movie set. The bulk of the production was filmed from 6pm to 6am, with the daylight scenes filmed on weekends. Michael would end up only getting 5 hours sleep a day. Martin McFly is a musician who is best friends with Doc Brown. It's not clear how those two became friends, it's probably down to Marty being wowed by the large amounts of technology Doc Brown has and allowing Marty to have fun with his inventions. Marty seems the odd one out of his family, where they seem content with their miserable lives, but Marty has ambitions and is meant for greater things. Michael J. Fox thought he did a terrible job on the film because he was so tired and he had no concept of what he was doing but he had total faith in the director. But to Michael's credit, he was totally wrong about his performance because he nailed it and it made him a superstar worldwide. Michael had played the guitar since he was 14 and had been in bands so he knew how to handle a guitar and sing. Musician Paul Hansen was hired to teach Michael to simulate playing all the parts that had been pre-recorded so it would look realistic when it came time to filming. Paul makes a cameo during Marty's band audition. Christopher Lloyd plays Dr. Emmett Brown. He is an eccentric scientist and inventor who has been struggling throughout his life to come up with a successful invention. He comes from a wealthy family but has spent most of his fortune on his crazy inventions. He came up with a flux capacitor in the 50s but never fully realised its importance to the 80s where he designs his time machine. Doc Brown is essentially a father figure and best friend to Marty. Leah Thompson plays Lorraine McFly. Leah plays three different versions of herself. In the first half of the movie, she's a depressed alcoholic and always reminisces about the past. She implies she never got up to trouble with boys, but when Marty visits her in the past, that is not entirely true. Leah had a big challenge to push the idea of her young self being in love with her son, which is very difficult for an actor, but she did it with such a sense of innocence and a great slice of comedy, she nailed the tone of her performance to bring her character to life. Crispin Glover plays George McFly, who like Leah, plays three different versions. Marty's dad in the 80s is a total coward, doesn't like confrontations and is an embarrassment to his family. Crispin is a totally eccentric character in real life and would often ad lib and add further to his performance. The director would have to dial him back to keep the character under control. Crispin has great comedic timing and watching him rehearse his lines with Marty in his garden is a great moment of his acting skills. 
When Marty gets to know his father in the 50s, he realises how talented he is as a writer, but just lacks the confidence to share his work with the world. Thomas F. Wilson plays Biff Tannen, the school bully, and also takes on the challenge of playing three different versions of himself. The actor Thomas was the total opposite of Biff and said to be the kindest person in real life, but he played the character so straight and serious he became possibly the most fondly remembered character out of the series, especially with his performance in the sequels. I think he took on the biggest challenge out of all the actors with the entire trilogy. Thomas has starred in loads of movies and TV shows, but never gained the success he had with the Back to the Future trilogy. During the 90s, he also provided his talents on the Wing Commander video games. Claudia Wells plays Jennifer Parker, Marty's girlfriend. She only has a minor role near the beginning and the end of the film. She originally didn't get the role, and another actress was given her part, but when they replaced Eric Stoltz, they recast Marty's girlfriend, and she got the part. Unfortunately, she never returned for the sequels because her mother was diagnosed with cancer and she was replaced with Elizabeth Shue for parts two and three. James Tolkien plays the discipline officer Mr. Strickland, who enjoys dishing out tardy slips and giving out advice to troublesome students. His intentions are good, but he has a very short temper and you don't want to be on his bad side. Mark McClaw plays Marty's older brother Dave. Everyone should know who Mark McClaw is. It's Jimmy Olsen. Dave appears to be working at a fast food restaurant. Wendy Jo Spearber as Linda McFly, she plays Marty's older sister. Her character is often having trouble with meeting the right guy, and it is unclear if she is at college or working. Wendy sadly passed away in 2005 due to breast cancer. The movie opens with Marty arriving at Doc Brown's place, which is littered with gadgets and clocks. He hooks up his guitar to Doc's amp and a humongous speaker. He strums a chord of the guitar, causing the speaker to explode. Doc phones Marty and arranges for him to meet him tonight at the Pines Mall. He realises he's late for school as all the clocks are 20 minutes slow. He grabs his skateboard and meets Jennifer at the school entrance. He gets caught by Mr Strickland and is given a piece of advice that he shouldn't be hanging around with Doc Brown. Marty is an inspiring musician and takes part in a contest but fails the audition for being too loud in front of these snobbish teachers. He heads home after school to witness his father George being bullied by his supervisor Biff. During dinner with his family, his mother Lorraine reminisces about her past, such as how she met George in high school when he was hit by her father's car, and George fails to listen and continues watching TV and laughing in a very nerdy fashion. Later that evening, Marty heads to his local mall car park to meet Doc Brown. Doc unveils a new time machine built from a modified DeLorean. The vehicle's flux capacitor is powered by plutonium that he's stolen from a bunch of Libyan terrorists. Doc demonstrates a time machine by accelerating it to 88 miles per hour, with his dog Einstein inside, sending it one minute into the future. He enters in the date of November 1955, into the time the day he invented the flux capacitor. Doc prepares for his first trip, but spots the Libyans approaching them, and they gun him down. Marty escapes and jumps into the car, but inadvertently activates the time machine, finding himself transported to 1955. He smashes into a barn and freaks out the owners, he speeds off down the street and is in total shock and thinks it's all a dream. The sun begins to rise and he runs out of petrol. Marty hides the car and heads back into town. Marty is freaked out and struggles to believe he has gone back in time. He enters a cafe and checks a phone book and finds Doc Brown's address. While he is there, he encounters his dad as a teenager, who even then was being bullied by fellow classmate Biff. Marty chases after his dad and saves him from an oncoming car and is knocked unconscious. He awakens to find himself tended by an infatuated Lorraine. His mother has the hots for him and begins making advances on him, and suggests Marty should stay the night. He panics and makes a quick exit and heads to Doc Brown's. He begs him for his help to get back to 1985. With no plutonium, Doc explains that the only power source capable of generating the necessary 1.21 gigawatts of electricity is a bolt of lightning. Marty shows Doc a flyer from the future that recounts a lightning strike at the town's courthouse this coming Saturday night. Doc has to formulate a plan to harness the power of the lightning and tells Marty he needs to introduce his parents to each other to ensure his own existence. With the title of the film and how it was advertised with its posters, you would think it's a big budget visual effects film, but the film doesn't really have many optical effects. ILM only had a handful of effects to visualise on screen. Bob Gale wanted the idea of time travel to be instantaneous. 
no sequences of traveling through a time hole, just a quick transition. So ILM came up with the idea of the fire trail after it transports to the future or past. They added bolts of lightning and energy that emerges from the car as it nearly hits 88 miles per hour. The best effect for me is at the end when the car takes off and flies towards the camera. What an ending, a perfect way to finish the movie. Alan Silvestri provides the score to Back to the Future. He first collaborated with Robert Zemeckis on Romancing the Stone. Bob wanted something classical and nothing contemporary. Many scores at the time were going with synthesizers. His original score for the movie was rejected by Spielberg who was not happy with it. The director advised the composer to make changes to his compositions and go for something more grand and epic, despite the film's small scale to impress Spielberg. With the short amount of time he had to make the changes, he thankfully blew everyone away and made it one of the most important parts of the film. The score as a whole made it one of the best soundtracks of the 80s. Robert Zemeckis was a big fan of Huey Lewis and the News and they offered to provide two songs to the film, Power of Love and Back in Time. Huey even cameos in the film as the teacher at the school who turns Marty down for the school dance. Power of Love was even turned into a music video. I adore both these tracks, I can listen to them all day and it's a pleasure to always hear them when I go to an 80s themed club. The original soundtrack album was released on LP and tape at the time and later reissued on CD but it only included two tracks from Silvestri's compositions for the film. Both Huey Lewis's tracks were included, the songs played in the film by the fictional band Marvin Berry and the Starlighters, one of the vintage 1950s songs in the movie and two pop songs that are only briefly heard in the background of the film. Thankfully for fans of Alan's score, in 2009 a limited edition 2 CD set of the entire score was released by Intrada Records and it sold out very quickly. So if you want to get hold of a copy you may have to pay a lot for it on eBay. Now there was three different games released on Back to the Future across a number of platforms. Let's start out with the versions released on the ZX Spectrum, Amstrad and Commodore 64. The game is loosely based on the film. The aim of the game is to get George to spend enough time with Lorraine for them to fall in love. If you are successful more of the photo segments will appear but if you are failing at the game they will slowly disappear altogether. Reviews were very mixed at the time. The graphics and the concept of the game were given positive reviews but it wasn't really fun to play. The programmers said they had two months to get it completed and felt they needed more time to do the film justice. The version for the MSX bears little resemblance to the film as well. A simple platform game as you travel on your skateboard to avoid the police and dive bombing birds. You have to get to the end of each level and make sure George and Lorraine are there in time as you enter a certain building. You can pretty much complete the game in 10 minutes. Now let's leave the worst till last. The NES version is notorious for its terrible gameplay and having barely any connection to the film bar a few visible references. The player controls Marty through various stages set in 1955 in which he collects various clock icons in order to advance to the next level. There are also three mini games at the end of each stage featuring Marty repelling Biff Tannen's gang of bullies from a cafe, blocking all the kisses Lorraine sends to Marty in the shape of little hearts and having to position his guitar properly to stay in tune at the dance in order for George and Lorraine to kiss. On the final stage of the game Marty gets to control the DeLorean time machine, dodging lightning bolts and obstacles while accelerating in such a way to reach 88 miles per hour to return to the future. The game only contains two songs from the film, The Power of Love which plays through most of the game and the other is Johnny Be Good. They barely sound like their original counterparts because the programmers sped up the audio to avoid any copyright infringement. The producer of the film Bob Gale has called the NES game one of the worst games ever made and even insisted in interviews that the fans should not buy it. LJN refused his requests to give inputs while the game was being developed. Once he was shown the game he asked them to make changes but he was told it was too late. LJN never really cared about quality, they just wanted your money. Robert Zemeckis and Bob Gale never thought they would do a sequel when they entered the film, but you can see they hinted at a possibility, but it was never in their minds. But due to the huge success of the first film, it was only a matter of time Universal would want them to pursue a sequel. In 1989 they set out to make part 2 and 3 at the same time. Seeing Marty go to the future of 2015 and heading back to 1955 and trying to avoid bumping into his other self. And in part 3 we see him travel back to the old west. 
I have already reviewed part 3 which you can find on my channel, but I will be covering part 2 later this year. I don't think the sequels are as good as the first film, but I will discuss the reasons why later this year. Back to the Future is probably the most fondly remembered and important movies from the 80s. I've reviewed Ghostbusters and Robocop, two films that were important flicks to me from that decade, and Back to the Future is just as special as those. The premise of time travel is always a difficult challenge, because filmmakers can get mixed up when crossing different moments of time or how things will be affected in the future, but this film is so tight and concise with its execution, it appears to be done with ease from the filmmakers. They use very clever visual aids to show you how time is being affected in the future, instead of bombarding the audience with huge dumps of exposition, saying you can't do this and that. For example, the disappearing photograph of Marty with his brother and sister is a simple indication that the future has been affected, and his goal is to keep that picture remaining the same. It's a simple narrative to help connect the story together. By the end of the dance, he's on his last legs, and slowly begins to disappear, and you can see him fade from existence but his dad gets his confidence back at the last minute to save the day. What I love about Marty is that he's a teenager of his time and seems popular at his school, but when he goes back to the 50s, he is like the coolest person around, invents the skateboard and refines rock and roll, but it's hilarious when he goes a bit too far with some of the 70s and 80s rock that perplexes the crowds. It really shows a great passage of time. What makes the film work so well is its tone, I think that was the most difficult challenge for Bob Gale and Robert Zemeckis. If one cracked appeared, I think it would have fallen apart. Dealing with the idea of Lorraine being in love with her son is a difficult subject, and the idea of a young lad hanging around with an eccentric old man may seem like a difficult idea to sell to studios today, because it's handled with such care and passion that it all translates to the audience as funny and heartwarming. The comedy is spot on, it doesn't really rely on punchlines or cheap jokes, it's all played straight with Marty essentially reacting to stuff around him. This is where a large majority of the comedy comes from. The 1950s Doc Brown always seems on the edge and ready to explode with every idea he has, and lives very much in his own world. Most of his lines are now so quotable, me and my mates would reel them off all the time at school. Now all fans who see Christopher Lloyd at conventions make him say, Great Scott! His character has become so ingrained in pop culture. There is a deleted scene where Marty is concerned about returning to the future, and with the changes he has made to the past, he thinks he may end up being gay, which Doc says why should that be a problem. You can see why they deleted that scene because it shifts the movie's tone and isn't something I believe Marty would say. There is a fantastic scene that really pushes their great chemistry before Marty leaves to attend the school dance, and Doc Brown admits he is going to miss him. It's going to be 30 years before he sees him again, and when Marty has to officially say goodbye, he hugs him. It's the closest we see them being really good friends. These are the moments that demonstrate the heartwarming friendship that holds the movie together. One thing that always got to me as a kid was when Doc Brown turns to see the Libyans approaching. I always found it so scary. The music enforces their approach, and when the headlights turn on, it always gave me chills. The photography by Dean Cundy is sublime, going with a soft lighting style and warm colours for the scene set in the 50s and with the 80s, it has a harder lighting and stronger colour design. I would have gone one step further and changed the film stock for the 50s period, so there was a more obvious distinction between them. The production design really delivers on making the 50s so believable. I love that scene where Marty walks into the town square and the Mr Sandman jingle is playing on in the background and you see how the town used to be. In the future, it's kind of a depressing rundown place that lacks any character. Like Marty, the audience are transported back to a real world. With the great photography and production design, it just gives the film an inviting atmosphere that keeps you hooked. I suppose the only thing you can question is the ending. It always had me a bit confused when Marty goes forward to 1985 and his parents don't recognise him from his appearance in the past or mention how similar he looked to their friend who set them up in 1955. Maybe through the passage of time their memory of him has somewhat blurred, but his father has written a book about the events, so there could be something referencing his memory of Marty and how he helped. It is a nitpick and an obvious issue with dealing with time travel. Maybe it could have been difficult to address the problem, and as it's so close to the end of the film, it would have dragged its pace out a little more, and it does work better when it's ignored and simplified. 
But the beauty of the ending is that Marty has made his life and that of his family so much better. He gave his dad and Doc Brown the confidence they needed and was rewarded with the car he always wanted. It's hard to pick a favourite character because I think all the actors do an amazing job and all have their moments. Doc Brown is certainly one that would make many lists, even Biff. To me, I always loved watching Crispin Glover play George. His awkward personality and mannerisms make him so lovable and enjoyable to watch. It's a shame he never returned for the sequels. I believe down to asking for too much money and they seemingly couldn't work out a deal. But I think he would have had a bigger impact on the sequels if he had returned. It's been 30 years since its release and the movie has hardly aged a day. Only the 80s fashion may make you chuckle, but it seems that 80s look has resurfaced again, with many hipsters wearing similar clothes to Marty, but these are things that don't bother me in the slightest. Everyone involved in the production did a fantastic job and all the actors totally nailed their performances. It's just a tight, well-designed movie. It's pretty much flawless and is so rewatchable. I can't recommend this movie enough. It's the perfect family film. There are rarely any movies like this today and God forbid they ever remake this series. It will probably cause the internet to explode. Back to the Future is important to many people around the world and it's part of their childhood and it's a movie you can revisit and appreciate more and more over time as you get older. It's a masterpiece in storytelling and direction, and it should be in everyone's collection. Let me show you my plan for sending you home. Please excuse the crudity of this model. I didn't have time to build it to scale or to paint it. It's good. Oh, thank you, thank you. Okay, now. We run some industrial strength electrical cable from the top of the clock tower down, suspending it over the street between these two lampposts. Meanwhile, we've outfitted the time vehicle with this big pole and hook, which runs directly into the flux capacitor. At the calculated moment, you start off from down the street, driving directly toward the cable, accelerating to 88 miles per hour. According to the flyer, at a precisely 10.04 p.m. this Saturday night, lightning will strike the clock tower, electrifying the cable, just as the connecting hook makes contact, thereby sending 1.21 gigawatts into the flux capacitor and sending you back to 1985. You see us uh, struggling in the car. You walk up, you open the door, and you say, you're lying, George. Oh. Uh -huh. Hey, you, get your damn hands off her. If you really think I ought to swear, yes, definitely. God damn it, George, swear. I think you got the wrong car, McFly. George, help me, please. Just turn around, McFly, and walk away. I just, I wish I wasn't so scared. George, there's nothing to be scared of. All it takes is a little self-confidence. You know, if you put your mind to it, you can accomplish anything. Oh, stop it! Oh, oh, oh. Well, you gotta play. See, that's where they kiss for the first time on the dance floor. And if there's no music, they can't dance. If they can't dance, they can't kiss. If they can't kiss, they can't fall in love, and I'm history. Talk about the future. No! Marty! We've already agreed that having information about the future will be extremely dangerous. Even if your intentions are good, you can backfire drastically. Fly, get a grip on yourself. Holy shit! If you enjoyed the video, don't forget to like and subscribe. You can find more retrospective reviews by clicking on these videos. If you want to watch my upcoming reviews early before they go live on YouTube, you can support me through Patreon.